Believe it or not, the scariest moment of my life occurred because of my best friend. Before I get to that story, let me give you some context. I became fast friends with a girl named Abigail when we were both freshmen in high school. We were inseparable. For all four years of high school, we did absolutely everything together. Every weekend she was at my house or I was at hers. During the summer, we would alternate between our houses, never going more than a day without seeing each other. Our parents eventually gave up trying to get us to do anything apart and even let us tag along on each other's family vacations. Over the course of our friendship, I learned that Abigail had a major flaw. She was insanely, competitively jealous. This wasn't your run-of-the-mill jealousy. She would get crazy jealous if I got a cute boyfriend. The key word there is cute. If I dated a guy she didn't think was attractive, she wouldn't get jealous at all. Her jealousy would manifest in getting angry at me for spending any time without her. As we got older, her jealousy made her extremely competitive with me over guys. If I met a cute boy, she would swoop in and try to steal his attention. Abby, as I called her, was gorgeous. She had jet black, naturally curly hair that fell down her back in perfect ringlets, and the biggest blue eyes I'd ever seen. She also had curves and a gorgeous smile. I, on the other hand, was insecure inside and out. I was by no means shy, but I never considered myself to be as attractive as Abby. I was kind of chunky and dressed modestly because I hated the way men stared at my chest. For me, it was no competition. Abby was the prettiest. When guys would hit on her, I just thought, that makes sense because she is gorgeous and is good at flirting. I didn't have enough confidence to flirt. I had a huge personality that I hid behind and thought all of my guy friends were just that. Friends. Because of this, I naively allowed Abby to bat her lashes and swoop in on guys I was into. Looking back, it's obvious that these guys gave Abby attention because they knew she would put out, but I digress. But onto the story here. It was the end of our senior year in 2007. Abby and I had been the youngest employees at a fancy restaurant for the previous three years, so several of our co-workers who were slightly older than us surprised us with a hotel party the night of graduation. By the time midnight rolled around, there were at least 50 people in our hotel suite. A little before midnight, a group of four guys joined the party who were friends of friends. Being young and naive, I remember thinking, the more the merrier, instead of, who are these people? As soon as these guys entered and started mingling, I noticed how cute one of them was. I didn't say anything to Abigail since I knew how she was. I had let her pick who she thought was the cutest and avoid her competing with me for attention the rest of the night. Maybe a half hour after the guys arrived, I was standing near the balcony doing shots with a few others when one of my favorite songs started playing. Being the hippie I am, I started dancing by myself. Suddenly someone took my hand and began twirling me around. I soon realized it was the guy from the group that I thought was cute, and he could dance. We twirled around until the song was over and then he introduced himself. I'm Dylan. You got some moves, girl. Thanks, I'm B. B was, and what everyone calls me. How did you hear about our party? J. He responded. J was one of our coworkers at the restaurant who was throwing us this party, so I stupidly assumed that if J had invited Dylan, he must have been an alright guy, an assumption I would soon regret. Dylan and I stood around talking for about ten minutes when Abby approached us. If you want to dance with someone who could show you a thing or two, save the next one for me, Abby said to Dylan, practically knocking me out of the way. Is that a challenge? It's a guarantee, mister, Abby said as she ran her finger down his chest and abdomen. I had had enough. Abby always got what she wanted, so I knew I didn't stand a chance. I turned to leave the two of them to it, but someone grabbed my hand and stopped me. Where are you going? It was Dylan. Uh... I looked from Dylan to Abby, who was glaring daggers at me. For a refill, I spluttered. I could use one too. Dylan beamed at me. What about my dance? Abby whined. I'm not really in the mood for a dance lesson, Missy. 
he had told her, adding a snarl in the last word. He was still holding my hand, so he guided me toward the bar on the other side of the room. As we were getting our drinks, I glanced over to where we had been standing, and Abby was still standing in the same spot with her mouth open. As soon as she noticed me, she gave me a look that sent shivers down my spine. I remember thinking, great, now I've done it. She's probably going to be terrible to me for the rest of the night. As a show of peace, I made Abby her favorite shot and brought it to her. She took it from me, downed it, and walked away without saying a word. Whatever, I thought. I tried. A little while later, several people, including Dylan and the guys he was with, were trying to convince everyone to go to a club that had just opened up about a mile from the hotel. At this point, I was well on my way to getting drunk for only the second time in my life. I was happy keeping the hotel party going, and to my surprise, so was Abby and about a dozen other people. Our party split, with the majority of the attendees going to the club and the rest staying at the hotel. At that point, it was about one in the morning. Abby started being nice to me again, so I celebrated by doing more shots. We continued drinking for the next couple of hours. Everyone was pretty hammered, but we were all getting along, dancing, smoking, and just having a general good time. Around 3 a.m., some of the party goers who had gone to the club returned to our hotel room to finish out the night. This included Dylan. Over about 20 minutes, our party regrew from about a dozen to somewhere around 30 people. To be completely honest, I don't remember a ton from about 1.30 to 3.30. As I mentioned before, I was drunk for only the second time and I was trashed. This is the first time I had ever truly let myself loose. What gets fuzzy in my memory, other, more sober attendees filled in the gaps for me. However, this next part I can remember in vivid detail. Around 3.30 I was going to the bathroom, alone because I'm not one of those females. All I remember is washing my hands and suddenly, there was someone behind me, grinding hard up against me. In my drunken state, I was confused at first because I thought I had locked the door and wondered how one of my friends got in. I finally clued in that it wasn't one of my drunk friends messing with me. It was a guy. In fact, it was Dylan. Finally, I've been dying to get you alone all night. Dylan slurred clearly way more drunk than before the club. What are you doing it? I'm cut off by Dylan spinning me around and sticking his tongue down my throat. I shoved him away to get free of his grasp, and he just clung to me harder. I tried to yell, but he swiftly covered my mouth and got both of us to the floor before I knew what was happening. I bit his hand as hard as I could. When he recoiled, I used my legs to kick him off of me but I couldn't get out because my kick landed him up against the door, and this enraged him. Dylan balled up his fists, and this predatory grin spread across his face as he said, I always love a fighter. The next thing I knew, we both crashed into the bathtub, and my eyes hurt really bad, but I keep thinking, just kick, bite, claw, and punch anything you come in contact with. I do just that and somehow become free of him in the tub. Just as I'm about to grab the door handle and make my escape, he grabs me from behind and I scream for the first time. I don't know how or why it took me so long to find my voice, but I did get out a loud scream before he had covered my mouth again. Suddenly the bathroom door opens and in walks Abigail. Dylan immediately lets go of me and tells Abby we were just messing around. She tells him that Jay wants to leave soon, so he better get out of there if he wants to ride with him. Dylan casually strolls out of the bathroom, and Abby shuts the door behind him. As soon as the door closed, I burst into tears. My clothes are torn, there's blood running out of my mouth from where I bit him, and my eyes rapidly swelling. I was sitting on the edge of the bathtub, and Abby knelt in front of me. Did he do this to you? She asked me. Yes. I managed to get out between sobs. Don't worry, B. I'll handle everything. You just stay in here, and I'll take care of Dylan, okay? I nodded my head, and Abby left the bathroom. I moved to the floor and leaned up against the bathtub, then heard shouting in our room and a lot of scuffling. I assumed Abby was 
handling everything as she had promised. I buried my head in my lap and waited for Abby to come tell me everything was okay and Dylan was gone. I looked up because I heard the door open and was paralyzed with fear. Dylan was standing in front of me. He locked the bathroom door, turned to look at me, and said seven words that haunt me to this day. Abby said you needed me in here. I was terrified and heartbroken at the same time. Abby said I needed him? Oh my god, she sent him back in here? My best friend sent a predator back into the bathroom with me because she was jealous. She chose to send my attacker back in for another round as payback for him not being into her. Dylan then reached down and grabbed my ankle, yanking me across the floor and beneath him. I remember thinking, this can't be how it ends. I'm not about to be a victim. If this monster's going to try to take what he wants, I'm not about to make it easy. I then had an idea, and I relaxed beneath him. I made him think I had given up fighting him off. He was ripping my clothes the rest of the way off when I saw my opportunity and kicked him in the face as hard as I could. Once again, Dylan's body was blocking the door so I ripped the hairdryer out of the wall and began beating the life out of him. As he shielded himself away from my blows, he writhed away from the door enough that I could slip out. To my shock, our hotel room was empty. Not a single person, not even my best friend Abby, was there. I would find out later that when Abby left the bathroom to go handle everything, she told everyone the cops were there. Naturally, everyone bounced. I panicked. I grabbed my purse from the closet and ran out of the room. I was barefoot, and my underwear and a ripped tank top had an eye that was swollen shut and more alcohol in my system than I had ever consumed before or since. From this moment on, my memory gets fuzzy again. The last thing I remember clearly is running from the hotel room. I don't remember anything from my drive home. I lived about 30 minutes away from the hotel, and by some miracle, I made it home in one piece. Not a smart idea. I woke up the next day black and blue all over. Everything was sore and bruised. The first person I called was Jay, my coworker who threw the party and had invited Dylan. I asked him how well he knew Dylan, and he said he went to high school with him and that they were hangout friends, meaning he has partied with him a lot but they aren't super close. I then tell Jay what happened. He was appalled and assured me he had no idea Dylan was like that. He kept apologizing for inviting him, but then started making excuses for him. Jay said when Dylan came back from the club, it was the most messed up he had ever seen him. He said, I know my boy likes to party, but i never seen him be that torn up. He must have done some heavy stuff at the club, I swear. Well, I don't care what he did at the club. He assaulted me. I snapped back at Jay. Jay kept making excuses, so I just ended the call. I took a shower and replayed the night's events in my head. Why didn't I make sure the door was locked? Why did I drink so much? How could Abigail do such a horrible thing to me? She's supposed to be my best friend. I called my other friends and coworker Jamie who had helped Jay throw us the party. Jamie tells me that she has also known Jay for years and there's no way he was in his right mind if he did what I claimed. If, if, if... If he did it? I realized in that moment that if my friends were having a hard time believing my story, law enforcement definitely wouldn't believe me. So, I covered up my bruises, made up an excuse for my parents about my black guy, and went radio silent for a week. Word spread about Dylan. I didn't answer any calls or texts, but I kept my phone on. I continuously received messages from friends saying Dylan was a good guy. I should hear his side of the story. Clearly, one of these friends gave Dylan my number because he started texting me. At first, he was begging me to forgive him. He claimed to have done a ton of coke at the club and had no recollection of what happened in the bathroom. He said he woke up and went to the hospital because someone had beaten him up. When I didn't respond, he started threatening me, saying things like, Jay told me, you were the one who caused me to get 15 stitches in my face and head. 
I'm not getting kicked off the football team because you say I assaulted you. I'm the one with stitches. I never responded to any of these messages. After five days, Abigail finally called me. We hadn't gone five days without speaking in four years. Before I could stop myself, I answered the phone without saying a word. Abby says, B, we're headed to the lake. Pick you up on the way? I didn't say anything. Hello? B, are you coming or not? She pressed. No. I responded and hung up. And that was the last time I ever spoke to Abigail. I decided not to press charges based on the excuse that I was about to move away for college in less than two months. Because I was young and naive, I also convinced myself that everyone makes mistakes. Maybe Dylan was a good guy who just made a horrible mistake. The weekend before I left for college would reveal just how wrong that assumption was. Eight weeks later, I was enjoying my last weekend of summer at home with family. The next week I would be moving over 300 miles away for university. Some of my friends invited me to an after dark pool party. I decided to go since this would be the last chance I would have to see them before leaving. I rode to the party with my friend Ashley. We were there for about an hour when Ashley tells me she just saw Dylan when she went inside to use the bathroom. I immediately froze in place. Ashley tells me to stay outside and she will grab her purse and keys from the house and we will leave. As I'm waiting on her to return, someone comes up behind me and grabs my hips while whispering in my ear. Are you going to let me finish what we started last time? Dylan. Instantly, I had confirmation of his character. He really was a predator. He showed me his true self when I first encountered him at the hotel party. He knew exactly what he was doing then and meant to assault me. Now, this piece of garbage was taunting me over it. He was relishing in the fact that he had gotten away with it. Now, I am not one to fear making a scene when I'm uneasy or feel threatened, so I screamed. Didn't I give you enough stitches last time? Stay away from me. And my sudden outburst caused everyone to look in our direction. Dylan threw his hands up and backed away from me. At that moment, Ashley returned with her keys and we just bolted. I never saw Dylan again after that. If there's anything I want people to take from this, it's that, one, you can be in an abusive friendship. Friendships are just platonic relationships and you deserve friends who have your back no matter what. 2. Never assume that friends of friends can be trusted. Trusted loved ones as well as strangers can and will take advantage of you if you let them. This happened four years ago. I'm a girl and at the time this happened I was 12 going on 13 in just a month or two. The friend I mentioned in the story was 14 at the time. The friend, Sally, who I was staying with that night, 14 year old female, was quite a bit older than me. At least at the time the two year age gap was quite big. At 12 to 13 years old I was about to start my second year of middle school whereas Sally should have been about to begin her sophomore year of high school. I met her in the beginning of my first year at a new school. She was older than the other kids in our grade and was considered one of the popular kids, and I think that's what drew me to her at first. We quickly became friends and before we knew it, we were spending every single weekend together. Seriously, every single weekend. Nothing seemed to be out of the ordinary. It was your typical Friday night. We carpooled to her family's apartment after school. I've always been a picky eater, so when her family had dinner, I didn't eat with them. I just snacked on the Pop-Tart that I'd stowed away in my backpack in case they ordered something that I wouldn't eat. Something to note is that her family was pretty religious. I wouldn't go as far as to say that they were fanatics, but they didn't allow their kids to watch horror movies or anything that was rated PG-13 or older. It didn't stem from the desire to protect them from something inappropriate. Sally's mother had an irrational fear that scary movies had satanic messages. We asked to watch The Purge, and her mom obviously said no. After some negotiating, she agreed to let us watch Hunger Games instead. After the movie, Sally and I went to hang out in her room. She'd put on some music, and being the age we were, we gave each other makeovers. 
By the end of it, we were looking much older than just 12 and 14. This part of the night is when things started to seem off to me. Sally wasn't the most positive influence. Despite being my best friend at the time, she was manipulative and got off on putting me down. She had a habit of talking to men online and lying about her age. Sally showed me some texts between her and the man she was talking to. I can't give you an exact recount of them, but they consisted of him trying to convince her to meet up with him and just the usual things you'd expect from a creep online. According to him, he was 19, tall, and blonde with soulful blue eyes. Once I saw the text, I asked if she had a picture of him. Something didn't sit right with me after seeing the messages. She showed me what he looked like, and he was very clearly not 19. This man was at least 40 and looked like he lived in his mother's basement. Then, we got a call from him. Sally answered without hesitation, and when I heard the voice on the other end of the call, I felt like I was going to be sick. You're so pretty. Why don't you come meet me? He asked. Sally said that she couldn't because she was spending the night with a friend. The mention of that sparked his interest, and then he proceeded to try and ask us both to meet him. Sally, lacking any common sense, said yes. Thus begun her plan for us to sneak out and walk 15 blocks to meet him in a deserted McDonald's parking lot. I didn't want to go. I was raised on stories of what happens to teen girls who meet random men from the internet in person, but after adamant pleading from Sally that she didn't feel safe going by herself, I agreed. We took our phones with us for the walk. I had a kitchen knife stuffed in my bra in case something were to happen and I needed to defend myself. The route we had to take to get there didn't have very many street lamps and there weren't any houses. We were surrounded by trees on both sides of us. When we got to the parking lot, the only car parked nearby was a black beat-up 2000 Toyota Corolla. The car was still running when we got there and from what we could tell, there was more than one person inside. The man from the picture got out of the front passenger seat and left the door open behind him before approaching us. I turned my flash on so I could see and he was obviously on something. I can't tell you what kind of drug it was for the life of me but his eyes were so wide that it looked like they were about to pop out of his head. He was jittery and kept twitching. I became very conscious of how big he was, maybe 6'2", around 280 pounds. For reference, my friend and I did not look our ages, even without makeup. I'm about 5'2". My friend was pretty tall, probably around 5'6 to 5'7", and we were both significantly smaller than him. The man reached out for us and caught my friend by the arm. I went to get my knife as quickly as I could, and that's when I saw his friends getting out of the car. He invited us back to his car and offered us booze and drugs, but after seeing my knife and that I was ready to call the police, he released my friend. I took Sally's arm and ran faster than I ever had in my entire life. We took the long way home to avoid them finding out where she lived in case they were following us. Once we got there, her family was still sound asleep. We locked all the doors, closed the blinds, and blocked him on everything. There wouldn't be any sleeping that night. We were constantly peeking out the window and to our dismay, that same Toyota was circling around her apartment building. Not once, not twice, but at least three times. I never mentioned any of this to my parents out of fear of getting grounded or in trouble. I'm 16 now and they still have no clue. I still get nervous when I see a car similar to the one from that night. As for Sally, her parents never found out either. We agreed never to speak about it again. Thankfully, she moved into a new house just a few weeks after that happened. Safe to say Sally and I haven't spoken in three years. She was angry at me for ruining her night, as she put it, and our friendship didn't last long after that. We had a pretty bad falling out, but looking back on it now was definitely for the better. And that was definitely the last night I ever snuck out. About seven years ago, my husband and I were living with his parents. His mother didn't work, so essentially we were there helping his dad pay bills that his mom and her friends, aka neighborhood tweakers, would rack up. His mother was friends with a couple, let's call them Debbie and Dave, who lived in an RV with their young son, and she agreed that for $100, they could park in front of our house and use electric and water. 
They were kind of odd, but nice for the most part. They'd never really been creepy, and I'd never been alone with either Debbie or Dave before this. Usually I would just exchange small pleasantries and passing on my way to or from work or school. Not a big deal. Anyways, summer rolls around and I had a bit more free time during the day, which meant I was hanging around at home more often. We had a big patio in the back and a nice setup with a table chairs and outdoor bar. I made a habit of heading out there in the mornings to drink my coffee and smoke a bowl. It was quiet and I enjoyed not having to deal with everyone else. This morning seemed off though. When I got up to get coffee at around 8am, the front door was wide open. Weird, but we had a lot of people in and out so I figured someone came and left and forgot to shut it. So I shut it on my way to get coffee and go out back. I finish my coffee and smoke and head back inside to get a second cup of coffee and the door again is open. I start to shut it again when I hear someone yelling at me. Hey, hold on. I need it open. I look out the door and here comes Dave with his huge basket of clothes. Can you show me how to use your washer? Yeah, no problem. So I take Dave to the laundry room and show him how to use our washer dryer, then try to leave to get my second cup of coffee. I'm halfway out the door when Dave grabs my arm pretty hard and says, Wait, where are you going? I need to talk to you. He then goes on to explain he's going to dump Debbie and their son and leave them at her mom's house. And then came the big creepy moment. You could move into the RV with me if you wanted. I tried to as nice as I could let him know that I was married and had no interest in living in an RV. Oh, married? Aren't you a little young for that? I was 22 at the time. Now if that didn't already make me angry and creep me out, the next sentence out of his mouth sure did. And I'm sorry, but you don't seem that serious about that guy because you flirt with me all the time. I didn't. I'd barely spoken to this man, let alone flirt with him. Being somewhat nervous and a bit mad at this mid-forties, balding, beer-gutted, jobless, dirty man, I laid into him. I let him know in a now not-so-nice way that I loved my husband, had never flirted with him, thought it was good he was ditching his son with his mom and grandma because then he'd have a way better life and lastly to screw off because I wasn't going to live in an RV with anyone and especially not him. Debbie later asked me if I had been rude to her husband. I then let her know the whole story, at which point she also got angry and kicked him out of the RV. I haven't seen Dave since he got kicked out of that RV and as for Debbie and the son, when the end of the month rolled around, they drove off to Nevada. This story happened sometime in the mid-1980s when my mom was a teenager in high school. My mother and my aunt grew up on a farm in central Florida that was relatively in the middle of nowhere at the time. We still live in this area and it's more urbanized now, but at this point in time it was mostly woods and farmland. My great aunt, uncle, and our cousins lived on the same property in another house, however, so they weren't entirely alone. But outside of that, you'd have to drive a mile, or maybe a little less than that or so before you reach their next neighbor. My grandfather coached for the local high school football team and my mother and aunt were cheerleaders. So on Friday he would have to coach at the school's game and my mom and aunt would be there to cheerlead. The rest of the family would usually come along as well since my cousins went to the school too and there really wasn't anything else to do in that small town on a Friday night. They would usually get to the game earlier than everyone else considering that he was a coach. One particular Friday, however, my mother started feeling very sick throughout the day, and by the time the evening rolled around, she felt horrible. She informed my grandfather that she wasn't really feeling up to going and that she would be staying home to rest. My grandma made her something to eat for dinner, and after that, the whole family, including my great-aunt and great-uncle, went on their way. She was alone on their property. For some context, we eventually ended up selling this property when I was a young child, so I don't have a ton of memories about my grandparents' property. One thing I can remember was that it could get very creepy at night in the evening time, and this was with other people there. 
so being alone on it at night must have been a lot more frightening. Anyways, my mom went to lay down right after they left, but not long after, maybe five or ten minutes, she realizes she needed to call her cheerleading coach at school to let her know that she wasn't going to be there tonight so that she could be prepared for her absence. Keep in mind, this is the mid-80s, so there's no cell phones. My mom has to get up and walk all the way to the kitchen to use the phone. As she is walking through the house, she starts to feel a bit creeped out, like that classic feeling of something not being right, that instinctual feeling we get when something is just telling us that we're in a potentially bad situation and may not even know it yet. Outside, it's getting dark out, and there are not many lights on in the house which contribute to this uneasy feeling. Very important detail, the phone in my grandparents' house has a longer cord than most phones at the time. She says that you could walk into other rooms and the cord was long enough that the phone could be brought out of the kitchen into the neighboring rooms, which are the living room, the hallway, and my grandparents' bedroom. In the hallway by the kitchen and by my grandparents' bedroom, my grandfather kept a shotgun on the wall, fully loaded and ready to go. Not the safest thing, I guess, but when you live alone in the woods, I guess you want to be ready to defend yourself the second you know you're in trouble. He had always told my mom and aunt, do not touch that shotgun unless your life is in danger. She took this very seriously and had never thought about touching the gun. By this point, she was in the kitchen, she dialed the number to call her coach and informed her about her illness. I believe they continued talking for a minute or so because she says that the coach was still on the phone when my mom heard strange noises coming from my grandparents' room. My mother, very frightened, told the coach she heard something and grabbed the shotgun off the wall, phone still pressed to her ear. She wasn't sure if she was overreacting and had imagined something, but she opened the door to my grandparents' room and what she saw made her drop the phone right on the floor in shock. The window was completely open, and there was a large man with one leg over the windowsill and one leg still outside. What was so awkward about this was he had basically stopped in the middle of coming in when he realized he had been caught by her as if he was not expecting someone to be home, or that he simply did not expect her to have heard him coming in. They just stared at each other for a good five seconds, him just halfway in the room, and her just standing in the doorway, phone on the floor with my mom's coach still on the line asking if she was okay, shotgun in hand, staring at each other, both almost unsure what to do. My mom, terribly frightened, finally mustered up the will to speak first. In a very shy and afraid voice, she managed, I, I, I have a gun. Turn around and leave or I'll shoot. The man just stood there. She said it was as if he was wondering whether she was bluffing or not. Finally, after what seemed like hours to her of just staring, he suddenly swung his other leg in very fast and turned quickly like he was about to charge her. My mother, terrified, with her hands shaking, fired the shotgun and hit him in the shoulder. The impact was so much that it knocked her back on the floor and sent the man directly out of the window he had come in. Blood was everywhere around the window. She picked the phone back up, now sobbing, telling her coach to call the police to her house. When she looked back, she saw the man running, clutching his shoulder, bleeding out all over their yard, running back to the woods behind their property. Keep in mind, he had just been shot in the shoulder with a shotgun. It's not like it was a handgun or something. This dude had basically just immediately gotten up like it was nothing and started hauling it off in the woods. I don't know the exact order of what happened next, but the police eventually did get there. My grandparents hurried home sometime shortly after, and the police were still there. I think what was most weird about this story was that there was a trail of blood that the guy had left as he was fleeing the property that went out into the woods. The police investigated and found that it continued for some ways into the forest and eventually just stopped. There was no body or anything, like the blood just stopped and they never caught up with the guy. I think it's bizarre because she had shot him in his upper torso with a shotgun and around the window in the room looked like a scene of a horror movie there was so much blood. How he got away apparently alive and so quickly without the cops catching up is quite odd. When 
I was in high school, I worked part-time at a Taekwondo studio teaching kids classes. Taekwondo was a big part of my life. My dad was Korean and was adamant about starting me young. So when I was six years old, I got pushed into the realm of martial arts. And I loved it. I got my black belt at age nine. And I even competed on an international scale. So when my coach asked me if I wanted to work part-time to get some extra cash and help with our lack of staff, I didn't waste a second to agree. Now because age is regarded differently in South Korea, I started American High School at 13, just a little younger than most kids, and there were even a few more my age. So it wasn't shocking in itself, but I was pretty small compared to most kids my age, so a lot of teachers and other adults thought I wasn't supposed to be there. Point being, I was very obviously a child. Now, I was also in a high school sports team that also required practice, so throughout high school my schedule looked like this. Mom would drive me to school at 6am for practice. I'd stay in practice after school until about 4.30 and walk to get the 4.45 bus to my studio. I believe it was my sophomore year when I was 14. I left school to make the bus per usual when I noticed a car driving really slow around campus. I went to a pretty big school, so I figured it was just a parent looking for their kid. That was until I got to the bus stop and noticed the car circling the block my stop was on. I've gotten catcalled before, honked at, etc., so while it did put me on edge and disgust me considering I looked like I was 11, it wasn't totally new to me. What was new, however, this dude pulling up to the curb and stopping his car in the bus lane. Luckily, this was a busy intersection near a school in rush hour traffic, so at least he had the common sense not to get out of his ratty old Volvo. Too many witnesses, I guess. At this point, I was on the phone with my sister speaking in Korean as to not let this man know that I was giving her a description of him, his car, the street, and his plate number. My sister knew something was up when I started speaking Korean because we almost always speak English at home unless we're talking to or with our dad. Mom was born in America, so she speaks English. But this ignorant SOB hits me with Ni Hao. And I wish I could say that was the cringiest thing, but this wouldn't be much of a story if it was. You Asian girls are so cute. Kawaii, you know. When I wasn't giving a reaction, this idiot proceeds to move into the passenger seat and stick his head out the window. You Kawaii. You so Kawaii in the slowest, loudest, most obnoxious voice that made me want to run into oncoming traffic. Then he picks up his phone, he dials a number and waits for someone to pick up. Hey man, I'm over here, there's this cute little Asian thing at the corner, I don't know, Japanese, Chinese, one of those oriental folk, speaks no English, she's real tiny, 110 soaking wet and sitting at the bus stop. Yeah? For sure. I right, see you later, brother. I don't know if it was the ignorance, the creepiness, or the fact that this 40-something-year-old white guy with a beer belly and a musty old Volvo was trying to sound like a teenager, but I wanted to dropkick this man off a cliff. But alas, my bus came and I practically flew on and sighed in relief as he drove away when the bus pulled up. But of course, that wasn't enough for him. You'd think that after how cute he said that I was looking would be enough, but no. That ratty old car drove behind my bus for 20 minutes until my stop. Luckily, I got off the phone with my sister and had already called my coach and boss to let him know what was up. He was like another father to me and I knew he was livid. He sent on his son, who we'll call B, who was 16 and but an absolute unit. If I hadn't grown up with him, I'd be scared too. This kid was 6'2", 180 pounds and was so ripped he looked like he ate raw chicken for breakfast. When my bus pulled up and I saw him standing across the street, I just sobbed out of relief. But of course, Creeper 2.0 had stopped behind the bus, jumped out of his car as soon as my bus came to a stop. B saw the dude and booked it across the crosswalk to meet me, and this dude cowered like a stray puppy. In a matter of seconds, this man was back in his Creeper mobile and sped off so fast he could actually smell the burnt rubber. B walked with me down to the studio and into the staff room where I cried with him and his dad for like 30 minutes and then called the non-emergency line to give all the information I had. From then on, B met me at the bus stop every day before work and when he got his license, he would just pick me up from school himself. 
We actually started dating about a half a year later and are still going strong. So, creepy old Volvo dude, thanks for helping me meet the love of my life, but I hope you get in the crash with a semi-truck. When I was 17 years old in 2005, I lived in a quiet village where nothing ever happened. At least, that's what we thought. I had just gotten my license and I was excited to meet up with my older boyfriend in the city on the weekend. It was the first time I was able to drive my car alone since getting my license, so the occasion was a celebration of sorts. I live in Wisconsin, so the distance between nowhere land and city isn't a great distance, 40 miles to Milwaukee. The highway to the major cities is a hop, skip, and a jump. Shortly after leaving the village, I noticed a white car on the side of the road, which wouldn't be uncommon for the area except for it being in summer. During winter here, it's always a common courtesy to stop and see if they need help, but since it wasn't danger season, I normally wouldn't think twice about it. However, there was an eight-ish year old boy walking away from the car. We were at least a mile away from civilization behind me, 14 miles to the nearest city, and I stopped to see what I could do to help. I had expected that he was with a grandparent that couldn't walk that sort of distance back to town for help. This was in a time when having a cell phone wasn't that common yet, and the young and the old being 2005. I pulled over next to the boy and asked him what was going on. He told me he was on the way to the only car repair shop in town, which was at least three miles away from where we were. I said that was a very long way off to walk, and I offered him a ride. He was hesitant and I told him I'm a student at the high school a mile away. I wouldn't let him hold my cell phone and my ID until we got there if he ever felt afraid he could easily dial 911 without me being able to stop him and we were only a three minute drive from where he was going. I said we should talk to the person in the car first and the boy seemed to panic. First red flag. No, it's fine, just go. I was like, okay... I was just a kid myself, and my local address was clearly on my ID. He looked at my ID for a minute and got into the car. He seemed at ease with holding my phone and my ID. This is a time before you could dial 911 without a passcode. I gave him my passcode and he seemed at ease when he could get into my phone. I told him not to check my boyfriend's messages because he was too young, lol. With the times and neighborhood we were around, that was reasonable to me. I didn't suspect anything. Then the car that was pulled over that couldn't move suddenly screeched out of its spot and raced after me with its blinkers on insisting that I pull over. I looked over to the kid in the passenger seat with my eyeball raised. Again, the child was about 8 years old. He just shook with fear next to me. The man in the car pulled over behind me, got out and slammed his car door behind him in a rage as he strutted up to my window. This was odd to me since they were supposed to be broken down and the kid looked extremely afraid. When he walked up, I rolled my window down enough so I could hear him, and he told me he was a social worker and the child I had picked up was a danger to himself and others, and I was in danger sitting next to him while driving. He could have killed me. I was afraid because I hadn't expected a broken down car to chase me, and I wasn't having a hard time believing what he was saying. I turned to this boy next to me after I rolled up the window in this guy's face. I said, Do you know this man? Is what he's saying true? I, I'm really sorry, I'm pretty scared right now. The fear in my eyes, I think the kid misunderstood. I wasn't afraid of him. I was afraid of the man outside my window. The boy said no. I think he was trying to protect me too. The situation wasn't sitting with me. Something seemed really off and with how aggressive the man outside my window was, I really was afraid he looked like he would have hit me if I had rolled the window down far enough. The kid said no, he'd be okay and got out of my car and went with him. The look of dread on his face haunts my dreams to this day. It still didn't sit well with me that he got into the man's car and they drove away towards the city. I called my date and told him I would be very late and went to the school as fast as my car could take me with a license plate in mind. I talked to the liaison officer at my school after I ran into the building screaming his name like a banshee. I told him about the kid and he said before I had even gotten there someone had dialed 911 about me stopping to pick up the kid and they were apprehended just as I got to the school. 
The caller was suspicious of me too, which scared my liaison officer. I was the school's biggest goody-two-shoes despite being the only goth. I gave my statement right there. I was told to never stop for a child again lest I were to ever be suspected of abduction, and he said I was still in the wrong. I shouldn't have gotten involved. What if the man had a gun? But the man in the car went to jail, and the boy was brought safely back home. He couldn't give me any details on the case, but since the man was apprehended and questioned, and the boy was brought home, that's all I ever was told. I'm not sure what crime I stopped that day, but that day I know I saved that boy from certain unknown abuse, and I'm just glad that I stopped to help. This story happened to me around four years ago, and when I think of a scary experience, it's this one. I've been listening to this podcast for a while now and decided it was time to share. Around this time I was seven or eight, I can't quite remember, and I was with my sister a year younger than me. We were going to sports practice and my mother had to run a few errands. If you have never been to a home's goods store, it's basically a store with all kinds of things to decorate your house. For instance, furniture, rugs, kitchen utensils, and other sculptures. We had been planning on buying a couch for somewhere in the house, but my sister was being stubborn and wanted to stay in the car. Finally, my mother just went in by herself, leaving us in the car. We had parked our car with heavily tinted windows in front of a locksmith shop, which is like a small booth that sold keys. My sister and I became very bored and decided to see how many keys on display we could count, which was fun at the time, I guess. We were sitting in the back of the car and we didn't have cell phones which will be important later. Then we see this man come to the booth and then another person came out from inside of it. The locksmith who left the booth had a small object in his hand. At the time I couldn't tell exactly what but now I know that it was probably an electronic lockpick or some other tool. They both shared a few words and pointed to our car. We were both scared and didn't speak and were even more frightened when they came to the driver's side door and we heard mechanical clicking sounds echoing through the car. My sister began to scream and my adrenaline fired up. My brain entered autopilot mode as I flicked the lock of my door, setting off the alarm to the locked car. The locksmith and the other man jumped and stepped back, frightened by the alarm. They both jogged over to the booth and shut the door. All the while, I kept flicking the lock of my door to keep the alarm going and trying to comfort my crying sister. The two men ran out of the booth and got in the locksmith van and drove off. I was too shaken to get the license plate number, but eventually my mother came back to the car and we tell her what happened. She didn't call the police, but he didn't get inside the car and there was nothing we could do. Every time we drive by that booth, I can't help but think what would have happened to us if I hadn't been quick to think. This story happened to me a few months ago. I'm a 24 year old female from a small city that contains a major hospital slash clinic where I attended nursing school. Because the parking is next to impossible I would sleep at my best friend's house before clinicals which are just like mock nursing shifts for students. My friend lives nearly a mile or less from the hospital, so it would be easier to sleep at his house than walk or scooter there if we were around. I had walked there for months with no significant events. Granted, it was around 5 or 6 in the morning and would seldom cross paths with another on the way. One morning, I decided to leave early to get a head start on some of the preparation required. It was around 5 in the morning and I was about to leave while listening to a Let's Read podcast. I had my earbuds in and was trying to get my scooter set up with an app on my phone. Out of nowhere I started to hear something that sounded like yelling. I took off my earbuds about a hundred feet away and there was a man shouting mostly unintelligible things. The man was very tall, hooded and dressed in all black. I couldn't make out his face but he looked unkempt and scruffy. I was only able to make out one of the things he was yelling which was, my friend got shot out here. I started back walking because the tone seemed threatening. Then he breaks out into full sprint right at me and I book it back to my friend's house. He has a four seasons porch before you enter the hallway to get inside and by the time I made it into my friend's door, he was right outside the porch. 
He was a hundred feet away and it took him about three seconds to get that close. As I get inside, I hear more yelling but I cannot make out the words and then a loud pop which I can only presume was a gunshot. I was frightened but mostly like, what just happened? I didn't call the cops because I simply didn't want to have to deal with being late. I've since theorized a couple reasons he would yell that someone was shot. One, he was trying to lure me by saying someone was shot and that he needed help. Two, he was threatening me and implying that we should not be walking alone on these streets. I let my guard down because I had been on that street before and nothing had ever happened but ever since then I've had a taser and mace at the ready with my head on a swivel. So do y'all remember when Popeye's chicken sandwich was at its peak and someone actually shot someone over a sandwich? Well, I got a story similar, just instead of taking a life, it saved mine. Let me start by saying this is all 100% true. With some quick Google searches, you can find all the details of this story within this story, but this is my side. At the time, I was going through a rough patch. I wasn't really working. I had my own florist shop, if you know what I mean. And I was sleeping late, barely paying bills, you know, the same sob story. I also, because I didn't have much extra cash at the time, hadn't had the Popeye's chicken sandwich yet. This will be very important to the story. Life changing, actually. I woke up just like any other day, smoked a bowl, shower, ate a little breakfast, and played some video games, hoping my phone would ring, and soon around mid noon, I would have a few good sales lined up so off to town I drove. I turned out of my gate headed north down Highway 76 in Wilson, Oklahoma. If that sounds familiar, it's because it is. If you heard the story of Molly Miller and Colt Haynes, Highway 76 in Wilson, Oklahoma is where they went missing. When we bought this property, the FBI or someone actually came to excavate for their bodies on our property. Their crosses are on the corner of my property and were there when we bought it. There's lots of stories about this area, and everything you've heard is true. Now back to the main story. With a little extra cash in my pocket around the time, one of my friend calls me and asks me if I wanted to hang out with him at another friend's, aka smoke a lot of weed. I say I'm down, and after picking him up in a 15 minute drive across town, we're rolling blunts, passing them around, laughing and coughing like it's a ghetto track meet, and telling stories that, surprisingly, you wouldn't believe. An eighth or so later, and a few stories passed, it's getting closer to dinner time and for everyone to start heading back home and getting ready for the next day, including the blue collar 9 to 5 workers. My friend mentions he hadn't had the Popeye's chicken sandwich either, and after a quick, what's better with weed than a fried chicken sandwich, nothing, conversation, we're off to get and eat our sandwiches. And man, they're good. I don't know if I'd kill someone they're so good, but between you and I, me being a former Chick-fil-A employee, Popeye's sandwiches are better. No, I eat like a starving baby hyena and my friend had the munchies, so 10 to 15 minutes later we're done and I've dropped him off. I'm driving home on Highway 32 in Lone Grove doing about 55 speeding up 65 miles per hour when I get past a cop with his sirens on like I'm a stranded turtle. I think to myself... I haven't seen anyone, so that's a little excessive, huh? About five miles later, I'm in the 65 area of Highway 32. I drive a little faster and I'm doing 75 when another cop again passes me like his life is on the line. Little did I know, I would soon find out it wasn't his life. I drive through Wilson and turn down Highway 76. It's overcast by this time and starting to drizzle a little. Again, I have to restate that I'm not just setting the mood. This is all 100% true, as painful as it is for me to say. And after looking at the facts, it's very painful. I'm about a half mile from my driveway, if that, when I crest a hill and I see more cops than a Fast and Furious movie. I slow down and the first thing I think of is my parents. They were out driving, so I call them and everything's all good. I take a back way home and, being whatever happened was directly in front of our friend's property, we call them to see... Did they know any details and what they told us was gut-wrenching? About 10 to 15 minutes prior, 
The same 10 to 15 minutes I was eating my chicken sandwich, that put me not directly following one of our further down neighbors, Kent maybe his name was, and the other person involved. They were driving home after the workday, Kent being maybe three miles, the other woman driver maybe ten seconds from turning her blinker on to enter her highway after following each other when an eighteen-wheeler coming the opposite direction crosses the center lane, side-swiping Ken and colliding head-on with the woman. There wasn't much left to Kent's bed on his truck. However, for the woman, there wasn't much left of the entire front end of her Chevy Equinox SUV. The car isn't at fault here. Every airbag, crush point, and support did what it was supposed to and capable of. You just don't realize how big an 18-wheeler is until you see the damage it does to another car. Miraculously, though, the woman was still breathing. A care flight was called and she was rushed to a hospital where she would fight for her life but ultimately lose the battle. She left behind a husband, a daughter, my niece played with her a lot at school when they still lived in the area, and a son the daughter and son of which would have been coming home with their mother that fateful day had their dad not got off early and picked them up early from school. It's not a scary story, but it's truly chilling when you think that a decision to stop for a chicken sandwich is the exact ten minutes I needed to be writing this today. A little over three months ago, a man knocked on our door while it was just myself and our son home alone. I was working from home at the time, so my attentions were scattered between my son and my other responsibilities. It was the middle of the day, so a knock at the door didn't appear suspicious, although it was definitely unexpected. Anyone who knows us will call before arriving. Assuming it was one of our neighbours, I opened the door to a man that I did not recognise. He was in his mid-forties, slender, standing at about five foot ten, with greying hair covered by a beanie, with worn jeans and a dusty jacket. Hi, I'm Tom from Thomas Ministries, wondering if you could use a prayer today. I'm a nice person, not one to rudely chase off people on our doorstep without reasonable cause, so I kindly decline and he went on his way. I watched out of the window as he walked down the street, not stopping at a single other house on the block. Seeing as how we were the only house with a car in the driveway, I didn't think much of him picking our door to knock on. Fast forward a few months to last night around midnight. My husband is a night owl, and is often up until 2am or so. Me and the toddler are fast asleep in our beds. When out of nowhere the doorbell rings, and there's a knock at the door. Our dog barks, and I wake up. Our bedroom is just off the living room, so I was able to lie there and listen as my husband opens the door. I overhear him telling the midnight stranger that we have a god, and we're not interested, and to leave in a much more stern and aggressive tone than I'm capable of. After the front door shuts, my husband enters the room for a few seconds later, and describes the interaction to me. The description and interaction matches exactly to the man that I encountered a few months earlier, except this time it's midnight, and there is no ministry on this planet that would encourage door-to-door -door ministry in the dead of night. My husband watched this man do the same things before, walk down the street, without knocking on a single other door in sight. Now, I feel it important to acknowledge the lack of judgement on our part. The door should have never been opened. We should have called 911 slash the non-emergency and reported it. This was a mistake, and fortunately for us not a deadly one. Lesson learned a thousand times over, and mistakes will not be repeated. Our house is protected, and we are ever more prepared. I sincerely hope that we do not encounter this man again. Thoughts of the Night Stalker documentary swarmed my head, and I think of how easily things could have gone wrong. How easy it would have been for us to look past this, and not recognise the signs of danger, given that the first time he knocked it was just myself that answered. I can't help but wonder why he'd pick our house again to knock on in the middle of the night. I'd like to think it's just mental illness. 
but you never really know until you know. And I hope and pray that we never have a chance to. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And if you've got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links down below. Thanks so much, friends. And I'll see you.